Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Whether you are looking for weekly Bible studies, in-depth courses, or talks related to the faith, you will find it at the ICC. Please check out our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. All are welcome to join our growing international ICC family. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or wrap. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered and let them that hate him flee from before his face. As smoke vanishes, so let them vanish and, as, and melt as wax before the fires. So let sinners perish in the presence of God and let the righteous rejoice. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Father Sebastian, the night's all yours. Thank you for being with us this evening. It's wonderful to be here and to finish off one of my most favorite texts from the New Testament, that is 1 Corinthians. I wish we could spend more time in it, but of course we have to also get to 2 Corinthians. And so we're going to do what we can to cover those things in the time allowed. And so let's jump right in where we left off last time. At the end of chapter 8, the end of chapter 8, where we saw Paul giving a warning to the Corinthians about those who were in the community thinking that because they were men of knowledge, the wise guys in the community who thought, well, since we know that Zeus is not really a god, we can still go to the temple to eat the meat offered to Zeus. Again, a text like that is so strange to us. Have any of you walked into a pagan temple and sat down to get some prime rib? No, I, I haven't done it. Okay, so, so, but that's, this was their world. And this shows so importantly, what my brother was saying earlier about the historical context about passages. We have to know their context if we're going to follow these stories. Because Paul wasn't writing 1 Corinthians to a bunch of Christians in 2023. He was writing the letter to Christians back in the so at this point, obviously the first century, I want to date this thing, about, about late 50s, early 60s, and to a church that he had founded, and he knew, their, he knew the names of the people that were there last, last time he was there. And then we can distill from these texts principles for our lives today, which Christians have done for 2,000 years. And so when we go back and look at the story there in 1 Corinthians Chapter 8, we hear about this crisis that the, the, many of the individuals in the church in Corinth believe that it's quite fine to just go to the local temple, the local restaurant, as, as they functioned, and eat the food offered to the pagan god of that temple. Because, hey, I now know there's only one true god, and therefore Zeus or whatever— are not true gods, so therefore I can participate in the benefits of that temple without, uh, without in any way compromising myself. So Paul warns them regarding the fertility cults, cult of, of Venus and things like that, that when you join yourself to a prostitute, those are the cult prostitutes in the temple, those, that's how those things worked there, you become one with them, and therefore you become one with that that temple, one with that goddess, one with that demon, that false god. He then addresses this idea of eating food offered to idols. This is in chapter 8. 
we talked about. And then now in chapter 9 and 10, he's going to address two different topics. It's really interesting how 1 Corinthians is laid out. It's, it's intercalated between these problems of doctrine within the community, along with this pastoral crisis of authority. And so as we go back and forth in 1 Corinthians, we find chapter after chapter addressing one or the other issue. Chapter 8 is addressing this crisis of, can I go to the temples to eat the food offered to idols? Chapter 9 now is addressing the authority issue, because they're related. The, the, the Christians of Corinth, the church there, they weren't just, you know, freewheeling it. They were being led by clergy who had directed them in this regard. And so Paul has to deal with that. In 1 Corinthians, back and forth, you keep hearing this. We're not going to talk about that right now. We'll deal with that in 2 Corinthians in a bit when we get there, where he has an entire epistle devoted to this very subject. But for now, let's zero back in on the, on the issues on the ground there, and that is for the, for the regular individual in the Church of Corinth, this problem of, can I go to the temple to eat the food after an idol? Is that still okay or not? Paul already said, bad idea. What if your brother sees you who is not a man of knowledge? Chapter 8. Uh, don't go to the temple of Venus. Uh, you join yourself to a prostitute. You become one with her. So he's given those basic warnings. But now in chapter 10, he gets into another issue, which as I said at the end of our lecture last week, is in so many ways, I would say, just from studying this, but I can say also from an apologetic standpoint, and having seen this in, in real life action in people's lives, that the, what Paul will say in chapter 10 is the most clear and strong apologetic for the real presence in the Eucharist. Now, that was not something Paul had to deal with, which makes it even stronger, because that's not what Paul was dealing with here. This is just kind of a, he just happens to mention the topic along the way. Let's get into chapter 10 and look at that. So chapter 10, he says, I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, our ancestors in the faith, and all passed through the sea. No, cloud and sea. We're talking about obviously the cross and the Red Sea here, right? And all were baptized into Moses. What? Baptized into Moses? Baptism is not till the New Testament. Okay, so baptism, baptizing in Greek means to be dunked in water. But it was also in the, among the Jews seen as kind of a renewal. I mean, just think of a natural experience, you know? You jump into a pool, you come out, you feel refreshed. You jump into the bath, you come out, you feel refreshed. So there's a very natural thing there as well. Among the Jews, they had the, the mikveh, these ritual bathings that they would do uh, on it, depending on who, which group they were, on a daily basis or whenever they felt they were unclean. And so this idea of renewal, refreshing, dunking, certainly part of that whole fabric. And so when he can say something like, we were all, our ancestors were baptized into Moses, right? They came out of Egypt, the filth of Egypt. And the cross in the Red Sea for Paul is like, it's like what baptism is for Christians, so he, he, he sees like the, the death of the old world, the old man, the old slavery of Egypt, the worship of the pagan gods, and now the moving towards Sinai, the freedom to worship the one true God and to move to the promised land. Okay, so he says, baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The, the sea, obviously, water and the cloud. This is that, that presence of God. This language is borrowed, of course, in Jesus' words in John chapter 3, when he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and the Spirit. We talked about that, and Andy can send you the, um, the lecture on the sacraments of initiation, where we discuss those things. Okay. And all ate the same supernatural food and drank the same supernatural drink, for they drink from the supernatural rock— which, which follow them, that rock was Christ. Okay, so what is he doing here? This is, by the way, this is one of the most important passages in the New Testament regarding the sacraments. 
When you read the fathers on the sacraments, the early Christians on the sacraments, especially by the time you get to about the third century, fourth century, this is their go-to passage, constantly referring to this passage. So this is really important. If you've never read this before, please make sure you, you know this passage well. Early Christians knew this passage well. Paul summarizes the idea of Christian typology here, the idea that what happened in the Old Covenant was a prefigurement that is fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And so he shows here that through Christ, what happened in the old is now fulfilled in the life of the Christians, the members of the body of Christ. While they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea into Moses, you, you Christians in Corinth were baptized in the water and the spirit into Jesus. And you didn't come out eating, eating manna and quail flesh, which only could sustain you for a while but then might die in the wilderness, as Jesus says in John 6. No, the, the bread and the wine or the supernatural food and drink that he gives you, this is Eucharistic, sustains, sustains you to eternal life. So he's showing the, the fulfillment of all these things. There they ate the quail flesh and the manna, Exodus 16. Drank the water from the rock, Exodus 17. After having crossed the sea, Exodus 15. And now... The Corinthians are living a life that is the fulfillment of these incredible mysteries that happened in the ancient world, according to their ancestors, as Paul says. And then he says a warning for them. So this up to this point, this is kind of good stuff, right? If you're a Corinthian, you're listening, you're like, wow, man. I mean, they're eating quail flesh and manna and water from a rock, supernatural gifts of food and drink, but I've received the supernatural gifts of the body and blood of Christ, those things sustain them for a while in the wilderness, natural food. These things sustain us for eternity. There they were, they were baptized into Moses. Here we were baptized into Christ. I mean, you could go on and on, right? The Corinthian at this point is thinking, wow, we're doing pretty well here. And then Paul warns them and says, yes, but nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Oh. Remember that? How many made it in? Who made it into the promised land? Two, Joshua and Caleb. That's it. Out of all the people that came out of Egypt, went to Mount Sinai, the whole, all that story, were wandering the only two made it into the promised land. And so he shows them, due, this happened due to their, their falling into idolatry, or to, to unlawful behavior, unrighteous lack, lack of faith, Aaron and, and Miriam, idolatry. He's going to list right here. Now, these things are warnings the RSV has. Warnings. Warnings. The word there, tipi in the Greek, tipos, image. For us, not to desire evil as they did not to be adulterous, some of them, whereas it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. He's referring to Exodus 32, right? Where in which they worship a pagan god, the god Apis, a fertility cult of Egypt. He goes on here to list all of the other examples, and we've done this in our Old Testament course, of, of the examples where Israel kept falling into idolatry and idolatry. And then he says, verse 14, Therefore, my brethren, my beloved, shun not the... And she says, shun the worship of idols. I speak as the sensible men. Judge for yourselves what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not our participation in the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. I remember talking to a fallen away Catholic one time about this. We were reading this passage. He turned seven-day Adventist, and we were looking to see. I said, well, so tell me what you, how do you read that? He sat there for a minute thinking about it. He said, I, I don't understand, but obviously Paul and the early Christians in some way believed that when they participated in the Lord's Supper, their gatherings, that in some way it was a real participation in some connection 
to the body of Christ. Yeah. Amen, brother. Preach the word. You got it. That's it. There it is. But then we kept reading. There's more going on here in the context, but from for those who are involved in apologetics and interested in these things, the, these this chapter and the next chapter are are so powerful. I've seen amazing in apologetic settings. Okay, so then back into the context for Paul here, he says, he says, consider the practice of Israel. Are not those who eat of the sacrifice as partners in the altar? Obviously, rhetorical question, yes. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, 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 no. Right? no. It's not like Jesus or the God of Israel. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, no. Yeah, he, he's anticipating their argument, right? Their counter-argument. He says, but look, he says, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons, and you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So uh, a reference back to the stories of Numbers, right? Provoking the Lord to jealousy. So very, very impressive argument there he makes that, look, you can't go to the temple of Zeus because what if, even though you, your conscience is clear, Zeus is no God, what if one of, your, one of the weaker members of the community sees you and gets confused by your actions? One. And then two, now, he really goes to something much more serious. And that is that when you're walking to the temple of Zeus, yes, Zeus is no God, you're right. Zeus is a demon. And when you walk in and participate in food offered to a demon, you're partaking of the table of demons, and you can no longer then partake of the table of the Lord. If you believe that in partaking of the table of the Lord, is in some way a participation in the body of Christ, in a participation in Jesus, then you must also accept that going to the temple of Zeus and food off an idol is a participation in the life of a demon. And that is not something you really want to mess with. So he goes on, he continues, by the way, those, um, obviously the ICC crowd is not involved in these things, but this is the kind of stuff we have to deal with. Uh, when people come to us asking about, how, Father, how come, um, I don't know what's going on. I mean, all of a sudden I've started to see, uh, um, you know, things in the room and at night things get really cold and icy and I hear voices and there's apparitions and, oh, really? When did this start? About a month ago. It's getting worse now. I wake up in the morning with scratches all over my body and I don't know what to do. And I, I don't know what to do. What's happening? Hmm. Did you play with a Ouija board last month? How did you know that? Oh, just a random guess. Or, no, I didn't. Did you go to a tarot card reader in the last month? Are you a prophet? No, I'm actually not. It's actually pretty simple. But can we go ahead? So, so, no, I didn't do it. Did you go to a seance? How did you know I went to a seance? I didn't. I just asked you a question. Did you go to a seance? Well, it was kind of a seance. I was at this little party with some college friends. And then we you know, called on my dead grandmother and... Well, that wasn't your grandmother that answered. So it's very simple. I can't tell you how many times I've been through that scenario. Someone calling in with a total crisis, manifestations going on in their room. I won't tell you the stories. You won't sleep tonight. But I just simply just, oh, when did this start? It's like a, so, you know, ask like a doctor, when did the symptoms begin? Um, anytime before that, were you playing with a, right? Boom, boom, boom. You can just, it's like, it's like clockwork. So predictable. All right. Anyway. Okay. So now chapter 11, Paul gets into another topic that is related to that. And that is the community meal, the Eucharistic meal, the contrast to that whole participation, the table of Zeus, but he gives them some uh, some uh, exhortation here in two problems he's, part he's, he's perceived. He's learned from Chloe's people that when the people appear for the, church, for, for the service, for the, the weekly gathering, as we'll see at the end of the epistle, this is on Sundays, first day of the week, that, the, that when everyone's finally gathered, there are two problems. Many of the wives... Many of the women who are married do not have their heads covered. And then he also have note, has noticed, who's heard about, 
that there is a problem in that the uh, that when they get together, it's a long process. This is before cell phones and watches and clocks and things. So it takes it's a process of people gathering half an hour to an hour before everyone's finally assembled. That by the time they get to the Eucharistic meal, some of them are full, some of them are drunk. What? That's not what happens on Sunday for me. Yeah, because we're living in a different context, right? So let's go back. First first topic he deals with in chapter uh, 11, verse 1 following. He says, he, he describes this problem in which the women, the women of Corinth, the Corinthian women, Christians, are coming to the assembly without their heads covered. Now, I am sure there's all sorts of baggage here among the people, depending on your age group and about that topic. Let's just forget all that right now. Okay, we're going to go back to context. In the ancient Jewish world, the wedding ring, the equivalent of the wedding ring, was a woman's veil. So if today, you want to know someone's married or not? You might ask them. But today in our massage, you just look, kind of look down at the right, well, left hand, I think, in this today now. It used to be the right hand. But look at, your, at their hand, you see if there's a ring. You say, oh, they're married. Okay, so... The, but the equivalent of that practice was a veil on the woman's head who was married. So what about the man? The men in Jewish culture had, could have multiple wives. So they didn't have a sign they were married or not because they were always available. I know you're thinking, that's not right. It's not right. Jesus addresses this in Matthew chapter 19 very clearly. However, that's for another topic. So, But at that point in the Jewish culture, the women... If they were available for marriage when they went out in public, they would not veil their head. If they were available, or if they were not available, they would veil their head. Very clear sign in the marketplace, who's available and who's not. You see a woman who's 35, 40 years old, good-looking lady, she either is a very new widow or she's a prostitute. This is how they distinguish these things. Okay, so... There's a problem in Corinth. The, the Corinthian, the Greeks didn't have this custom. The Greek women would cover their head with a veil if it was hot outside and they wanted to shelter from the sun. Or if it was cold outside. Those, it was just kind of natural protection. There was no connection to marriage or no, it had nothing to do with that. So in the Corinthian church, Paul's heard about a crisis. Remember, the church originally is founded from a Jewish synagogue. And remember, Jewish Christians are traveling from church to church. You hear about it all, the, all throughout these epistles. Imagine a Jewish Christian showing up from Palestine. He got off a boat. He gets an F, you know, it's saying Athens, and he goes to the church of Corinth. And he walks in the back of the room. And as soon as he comes to the back of the church, he sees, and this is back when, and relatively recently, men and women were on separate sides of the building. He sees all the women on one side. There was another problem in Corinth, and St. John Christendom talks about this whole thing, if you want to read his commentary on the epistle. In Jewish culture, if a man had hair beyond his shoulder, he was considered to be a homosexual. His beard might grow long, like we have Shane Switzer, nice beard there, and the hair on the back would be left to about shoulder length. So why don't they shave it? Because they didn't have that kind of stuff. It was, you'd have to, you know, take your sword or something, okay? You'd cut your head all up. So men just basically, unless they're extremely wealthy, they would just cut it off and saw it off, keep it right around shoulder length. If it went beyond the shoulder and the back, it was a sign that you were uh, interested in other activities in public. Well, the activities wouldn't be in public, but that's how you let them know in public. It was a sign you were homosexual. And so... Women in Jewish culture, very strict rules on this. They let their hair grow beyond their shoulder. Men did not let the back hair go beyond their shoulder. Very clear of who was who. Back in the 80s in America, it was, you know, which earring you had in or something, what side, I don't know. But so, so then imagine the situation in Corinth. They don't have this background in the city of Corinth. In the city of Corinth, to have short hair shaved or cut off real short meant you were, you were, if it was styled, you were very wealthy, but if it was short, you were, you were a servant of some sort. But if your hair was long and growing in the back, flowing, 
It was a sign that you were educated in philosophy. This was how, this is your outward sign of how smart you were, how long your hair was. And you remember the Corinthians, how into this stuff they were. So can you imagine a poor Jewish man, 25 years old, looking for a bride, comes from Jerusalem, walks into Corinth, comes to the church in Corinth on a Sunday morning, walks into the back, and he sees all the women on one side without veils. Wow, this, they're all available. He looks over to the other side and says, no wonder, they're all homosexuals. So this is context, context, context. This is what is going on here. In the Jewish Judeo-Christian culture, the early church, the women who were married would put a veil on. You know the story that you know about veils today, through still the remnant of this. If you knew, you remember your great grandmother, there was still some of this going on. But anyway, forget all that, it's all done now. But you still have a hint of this in our modern culture in two places. A nun wears a veil. Why? Because the dedicated virgins who were in the churches and the various parishes who would who were forming these little kind of almost modern, local convents kind of to help the poor, the, the early Christians, the, the clergy started to encourage them to wear the marriage veil because otherwise it'd be confusing to the young men on Sundays whether or not they were available or not for marriage. That's where the nun's veil comes from. It's actually a marriage veil. And the, and the remnant of the marriage veil we have in modern society is at the wedding, right? You, nice lady goes to get her wedding dress. And, and honey, what kind of veil do you want? I don't know. What after veil? I don't know. But this is what's done. Well, I'll tell you what's done because it goes back to that ancient tradition of you're going to get married. Now you're going to be out in public. And now you're going to have to have some sort of a, a covering to make clear that you're off the market. And in fact, the whole white and the colored thing, you find there's still a lot of old orders. They'll get a white veil when they first join the convent. And for a couple of years, they're a virgin and, they're, and they are betrothed. On the day of their wedding, that is when they make their final vows, white veil goes and they get their colored veil. This is the same ancient Jewish tradition. I'm sure there's going to be Q&A on that one. All right, so now let's keep going. So in chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 17, he goes on to talk about another topic, another problem he sees in the community. If you look at the, at the, the Last Supper narratives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he actually gives you one here too. Paul gives us one. They gathered together to celebrate the Last Supper. The mist, it was a Passover meal. They ate and drank. And when they were done eating and drinking, they were done with the Passover meal, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say the same thing. Then Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body. Then he took a cup and said, this is my blood. They had already been eating and drinking, but it was a Passover meal. These were Jews who had been raised in this pious tradition that this was a religious celebration. This was not a time to have a big party. It was a remembrance of what God had done for them in, Ex in the book of Exodus, the Passover. But when the Passover, the Christian Passover meal which continue to be celebrated that way in this very early apostolic stage. They get together. Again, this is a Jewish period. The Jewish Christians gather together. They would eat and drink, celebrating a Passover meal, as they talked about the readings from the Torah and the prophets and Psalms from that morning from the synagogue. This is late Saturday evening after sunset. And while they're waiting for everyone to gather together, the Jews hadn't worked that day, but the Gentiles had. So the Gentile Christians are slowly showing up, Finally, after, say, an hour or two, everyone in the community is assembled at the local church, say, maybe 50 people or something. Everyone's here? Where's Bob? He just came in. He's just in the restroom. Okay. So everyone's here? Okay, great. Let's begin. Well, up to this point, the Jewish Christians have been sitting there eating and drinking and talking about the scriptures of Israel from the synagogue service the morning before. And now it's time to begin the Eucharistic service. This is the two parts of the Mass, by the way, of our service. The same, same thing. Uh, so the, in the Greek community here, where they don't have this strong Jewish influence of history, when they're getting together, can you imagine the situation as they're gathering slowly over, say, an hour or so? And there's no watches. There's no 
clock tower, something like that, no cell phones. So it takes a while to assemble people. And so, uh, and by the way, this is where the church bell comes from. Ding, 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 right? Okay, everyone run. All right, so also the little bells in the Western liturgy for the Eucharist. Okay, so the, um, so the, as the people of Corinth are gathering, Christians are gathering, it's a process, we'll say over an hour or so, or who knows what, and the people are gathering together. Now, the Jewish Christians that are there are going to, this is a pious experience. This is a remembering. They've been doing this their whole lives as, as Jews. But for the Greeks, if there's anything the Greeks know how to do, is how to party. They know how to have a feast and have wine. And so here you've got a problem in this Greek church of, of, of Corinth, very wealthy and very heavily Greek church. This pregame show, this early period before they celebrate the Eucharist, was turning from being a pious Jewish Christian Passover meal, in which they'd talk about the life of Moses and the Torah and the prophets and things from the, from the, the, the readings from the synagogue that morning, into a Greek party. And by the time everyone's finally assembled, as Paul says, I've heard from Chloe's people, some of you are drunk, and some of you are so full you don't even want to receive the Eucharist. He says, look, if you want to eat and drink, go do it in your house. But this is not for the church of God. This is something else we're doing. And then he goes on, he warns them, he says, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also received, what I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Ev Charistin, to give thanks. Is that word? Eucharist, where we get that word? To give thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup, after a supper, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27. Whoever therefore eats, the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning symbols. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not what it says. Profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. I'm not kidding. I, I have seen uh, in this particular seven day Adventist friend of mine. At this point, it was over. Is it uh, okay, Uncle? I'm done. Uh, you cannot maintain a late Protestant idea that there is no connection between the body of Christ in some real way, however you want to explain it. Consubstantiation, transubstantiation, mystical experience, whatever you, whatever language you want. There's no way to deny that the early Christians understood that there was a direct and real relationship between the bread and wine of the Eucharistic meal and the body and blood of Christ. No way. In fact, he goes on to say, let a man examine himself. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For as anyone who eats and drinks the cup without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself, this is why some of you are sick and some have died. All right. Chapter 12. Paul then goes on to talk about the, the members of the community. that They're divided. We heard about this back in chapter 1. They're divided. Some say Paul. Some say, you know. They're divided also according to their rank or authority or gifts they have. And so Paul explains that, look, there's a variety of gifts from the Spirit. He says this in many other places. I would put a little note for yourself. Chapter 12 there, put a little note. Put Romans 12, Ephesians 5. You can go on and on. But where he talks about these kinds of things, that the God has given his Spirit, and his Spirit gives a multitude of gifts, a variety of gifts. And he's trying to bring unity to the community. And he says that, you know, like a body has many members, many parts, so the body of Christ has many members, many parts. Therefore, when one part is strong, it strengthens the body. When one part is weak or sick, it affects the whole body. This is why we need to be very careful, among many other reasons, about sin. When we are sick, our soul is sick in sin. We are affecting the Christians in our community and in the entire Catholic Church. If you believe in the sacraments, if you don't believe in the sacraments, you say, oh, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what I do. But if you believe what we have always understood since the time of the apostles, that there's a real relationship between our sacramental experience and, the, and our entrance in the body of Christ, then you must accept that when we are healthy and are living the life of Christ, then our life and our strength and str enlivens those around us. And when we are sick, injured, 
as members of the body of Christ, then we affect those around us. Just like a broken finger is going to affect the rest of the hand or a broken arm is going to affect the rest of the body. You can only have one arm. You got to, The other arm has to shoulder the burden or let's say a, a broken toe on one foot or a broken foot or broken leg. It's going to, one eye's not working. The other eye's going to have to, and the other senses are going to have to shoulder the burden. Okay, chapter 13 and 14. Paul now addresses another issue, which flows directly from what he said before. And that is that while there's a variety of gifts, there's also a hierarchy of importance of these gifts. The Corinthians were fascinated with the gift of languages. Why? Well, you go back to their context. They were into fancy talking fancy thinking, right? Rhetoric and philosophy. And so someone who could speak languages they formerly did not know, or they could speak and somebody would understand them in a language they were not speaking, this is a sign of incredible genius. Think of people that you know that speak more than one language. Wow, that's smart. Think of people that you've heard of that speak multiple languages. John Paul II spoke something like 12 languages or more. Okay. Wow, man, he must be really smart. I guarantee there's no one who's listening to this would say, 12 languages? That's no big deal. Then you say, wow, that must, he must be really, really smart. Okay, so so that's so think, put yourself in that world, that very natural idea. They heard they have this gift of someone speaking and someone else understands it in whatever language they speak. Oh man, I want that one. Paul says, that's not the one you want. That's not the most important one. And he goes on, he says, look, the most important thing of all is the gift of charity, of love, unity of the brethren. This is in chapter 13. But in chapter 14, he goes into much more detail about this. And he says something that is extremely important for us here. He says in chapter 14, verse 20, brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Be babes and evil, but no, it's innocent, right? But uh, uh, but thinking, be mature. In the law, it is written by men of strange languages, tongues, and by the lips of foreigners, will I speak to this people? And even then, will they not listen to me, says the Lord? Verse 22, I'd, write this, I'd highlight this. Thus, langu- the gift of languages, now I'm, I'm translating here, the RSV puts tongues. I can't stand that translation. Why? Because every modern Christian, here is the word, tongues in a way that they would not have heard it 150 years ago. Tongue in English means the muscle in your mouth or language, the thing you do with it. As in many, it is in many languages, glossa in Greek, the muscle in your mouth or the thing you do with it. Latin, lingua, the muscle in your mouth or the thing you do with it. The very word we get language from. Right? But in modern Christian experience, especially English-speaking Christians, we go back to Azusa Street in the early part of, part of the last century to when a very small group of Christians, at this point it was it was a little meeting house, a shed in a, in a field on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, 1904, 1905 or something. There, there was a, it was a little group, a place, it was a, a place where various Protestant ministers traveling through would preach. And one of the groups that was there using the building was a group of Seventh-day Adventists who had broken away from the main group of Adventists. And uh, one of the preachers there got excited. He was reading Acts. and well, look at this language, this idea of gift of languages of tongues. And they started babbling. Okay, so, and from then until today, people think of the gift of tongues as a very recent event in Christian history, this idea of Pentecostal babble, for lack of a better word. If you look at modern Pentecostal or charismatic babble, and I'm sure I'm offending a few people here with some background in the charismatic movement, it has nothing to do with this text. Nothing. Look at what it says here. He says, thus languages, the gift of languages, the gift of tongues, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is not for believers, but for uh, not unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church assembles and all speak in languages outside, unbelievers will think they're mad, right? You go to a modern Pentecostal or charismatic me, what happens? Everyone starts, are you, are you a member of the community? Oh yeah, check this out, right? 
and they start going. And now that's a sign you're really a member of the community. This is the exact opposite of what Paul's talking about. Because if you go back to the story of Pentecost to get their languages so the apostles could preach the one word of God that is Jesus to a multitude of outsiders who did who spoke other languages. And the gift of languages has been from then until today in missionary activity where there is a need for the gift. God doesn't give gifts that you don't need. He gives it to missionaries who are in situations where they walk into a village, they preach the gospel in their own language, and the villagers hear it and come for baptism. Any of you who know anyone who's in serious missionary work in foreign language, in foreign regions, they will tell you of either their own personal experience or very close experience they've had with the gift of languages. I'm sure we can talk about the charismatic movement in the QA period. Okay, so now chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preach the gospel to you, which you received and which you stand by, which you are saved, if you hold it fast, notice the disjunctive, if, no one saved, always saved there, unless you believed in vain, for I, be, I delivered to you as of the first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas, Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to, to more than 500 brethren one time, of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, Bishop of Jerusalem, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles. So what is he talking about here? The problem in Corinth is, remember, there are a bunch of dualists. They have that Greek dualist background. And so salvation for a pagan in this world is release from the body to fly off into the clouds in the heavenly abode for all eternity eternal spiritual existence. But Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Our gospel is that there is one God who created the heavens and the earth, the spiritual and the physical, and that it is in need of restoration, resurrection. And so that the so that even though you may die, someday you will be raised from the dead, and you will stand in that body on earth before the God who created all of us and answer for what we've done like Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. And the wicked, we toss in the lake of fire with their bodies, but the righteous will remain. And a new heaven, a new earth, he says, the heavenly Jerusalem will descend to the earth. You hear about this in the book of Revelation. And then the existence will be like a new Jerusalem where God dwelt among men on earth. And they consist in like a new garden of Eden. That's the end of the book of Revelation. So, but for the Corinthians, this is crazy language. No salvation, escape from the body, escape from this earth, because that was all created by the bad gods. I want to go off to eternal spiritual bliss. As I mentioned before, so many Christians today are heretics in this regard. You ask the average Christian, what happened when you die? Oh, well, my body will be buried or burned or eaten by sharks. Or and then I'll fly off into the clouds. Maybe you talk to a Baptist, you go straight to the pearly gates. I'll know a Catholic, you got a little time in purgatory. But eventually you're going to get to the pearly gates, a couple jokes with Peter, you get in. And then what? Well, then I play harp with the angels. I see my friends. There's a bright light we stare at, and we sing songs. And then what? What do you mean, then what? Well, what happens next? Anything important? No, man, heaven's forever. Okay, then you say, heresy. Don't you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? I do, but I always wonder why is that important. Because through his resurrection, you can be raised. This is what Paul talks about in our baptism. This is what ta Paul talks about when Jesus says, he says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood is life to him, and I will raise him up in the last day. What am I going to do my body with in the clouds? You're not going to be in the clouds. Where have you been? So now, in chapter 15, he addresses this crisis, which is so important for us today. Because I would say, and I'm not a statistician, that I would say somewhere around 99% of Christians today are heretics in this regard. And it's not regarding some like kind of minor topic. This is the good news. Now I'm getting excited. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so now in chapter 16, in chapter 16, Paul says, look, I'm coming to visit you. Remember, he's back in Ephesus. He wants to come to them after passing through Macedonia. He's going to go up to Macedonia and then come down to Corinth. And so Chloe's people are there delivering this letter. You remember this? And so in chapter 16, he says, 
Now concerning the contribution of the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do. Church of Galatia, what? Notice how you can see exactly where he's on his journey. He just came from the church of Galatia. He's in Ephesus. He just wrote his letter back to the Galatians, and now he's writing a letter to the Corinthians. In the Pauline course, and Annie will link these for you, where we dealt with Acts, the Apostles, the key to the Pauline epistles, how you can see this whole flow. They really come to life that way. He says, he says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside to store it up as he might prosper. So that contribution may not be uh, made when I come. Right? Can you imagine? Paul shows up. Oh, no, can drive. it take a while. So, so now what he has to do, he wants them, you start piling this stuff every time you gather together. When do they gather together? On the first day of the week. Sometimes some day Adventists will say, it doesn't say they gather together on that day. Okay, Mr. Seven-day Adventist, when do you take up collections for the poor? On Saturday, when you are gathered together. Thank you very much. Okay, so the gathering together for the early Christians was on the first day of the week, not to fulfill some obligation from the Ten Commandments or some idea of had. No, to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord on that day. Chapter 16, verse 5, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. You see that? You can hear he's going to head from Ephesus up to Macedonia, Troas, Macedonia. He's going to head down. Okay. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians is intimately related to this. It covers really one subject, and that is the crisis we saw over and over in the first epistle, here and there, back and forth. The, 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 these heresies the Corinthians are dealing with are not simply just coming from themselves. But there are leaders in that community that are directing them in this regard to worship, to participate in the worship of pagan gods, back then, Zeus. So the, the Corinthian Christians are certainly culpable for what they're doing, but there's someone else that's much more culpable, and that is those who are directing in this regard, to whom they're trusting their, their, spiritual, their spiritual understanding of the faith, their doctrinal understanding of the faith. And so Paul now spends an entire epistle. When he gets up to Macedonia, he's only a couple of weeks from Corinth. But before he arrives, he decides in another letter called 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians is intended to make sure that these false apostles, as he refers to them, either get out of town before he gets there, or correct their ways. It's a very heavy-handed epistle. If you've ever read 2 Corinthians, this is where people often get the idea that Paul was a very, very angry man. Paul was not an angry man. He was a very good man. But he certainly got angry once in a while. And especially in this regard, when it came to the proper preaching of the gospel and wolves coming in among his flock and destroying the faithful. And so 2 Corinthians is very hard hitting. He, he, in this epistle, the second epistle, and you can read this on your own, the vast majority of it, Paul talks about not only the lack of authority of these false clergy that are there, these false apostles, but he also has to highlight his own authority as an apostle. And he does this throughout the epistle in many places. The, um, in chapter 1, verse 15, Chapter 1, verse 15, he says, Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a double pleasure. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia as, and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans like a worldly man, ready to say yes or no at once? That's true. So they're accusing him. They've heard that, well, Paul's right there in Ephesus. Why isn't he coming? And Paul says, look, I did want to come directly. I want to come back in the boat with Chloe's people. And then I'd go visit Macedonia, and then I'd come back and see you again. But I, I, that wasn't God's plan. So I went to Macedonia first. And those who are saying that I'm not going to show up, I'm coming, and they better get ready. And the, the epistle goes on and on like this. He says, in chapter 5, in chapter 5, he says, We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, 
a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here indeed we groan and long to put on our heavenly dwelling, so that by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we sigh with anxiety, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at the home, in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive good or evil according to to what he has done in the body. All right, so there he is coming right back to that now. And the again, 2 Corinthians is the vast majority of it. He's just correcting these individuals. But he does get into this, this what, what is it that these false clergy are teaching these people? Well, he had to deal with the 1 Corinthians. And so it comes up here also in 2 Corinthians here, the value of the body, that, that, the, that someday we will be raised, and someday we'll be judged in what we've done in our body. Okay, and then lots of other passages we read here, but Annie will kill me if we go over. So let's flip over to chapter 12. Chapter 12, he's been talking about how these, he calls them super apostles. He's mocking them, these false apostles who are running the church in Corinth in his absence, how different he is from them, and how much more qualified he is than they are. But then he goes on to talk about something that certainly sets him apart from them. That's chapter 12, and is helpful for us not only because of it commenting on this issue, but it also has some great spiritual direction, I think, for us as well. I must boast. There is nothing to boast, nothing, nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelation of the Lord. I know of a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Third heaven? Wait a minute. Okay, so the for the Jews, there were three heavens. The word sky, shemaim. Think of the word sky. That would be better for us in English. So third heavens. So there, there are three realms. There was, and for them, everything was in threes. Complete. So the the first heaven is, you know, where you're, you know, waving your, air, your hand around and things like that. This is it. This is the first level of the sky and where you see birds flying around and stuff, and you can shoot them with an arrow, and you can hit the bird, and it falls, the whole thing. This is the first heaven. The next heaven, the next layer, they saw as the places where you saw the, the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon, things like that flying around. The clouds even, right? Beyond where you see most birds. And then the third heaven for them was the place that was beyond their sight, and that is where God dwells. So he's saying, I was taken, he, this man was taken to the third heaven, that is the place of God. So he says, he was caught up to the third heaven, whether in body or out of body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. So you understand what he's saying here? He's saying, look, I don't matter. I, Paul, the man, I don't matter. But I'll tell you what, as an apostle and member of the body of Jesus Christ for which he has sent me, there is certainly an importance here. So it's not me, it's God. He gives incredible humility here. And he says, though I wish to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears of me. So Paul has not talked about this stuff normally. If you read through Acts, you read the Pauline Epistles, you get hints that God talks to him directly. He has visions and sees Jesus and stuff. So he says, and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times, three complete, right? Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he says there, look, I, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. He says in other places. But what God is doing through me is something you might want to pay attention to here. And so he describes the incredible experience he's had in Jesus. And therefore, it's that person, that Paul, that you need to be paying attention to and listening to. I, Paul, the human being, the regular old Jew, I'm a sinner just like you. But I'm going to tell you that God has given me authority and the gifts to preach the gospel to you in a special way. So I think that's pretty clear what you're, you can see in there, but I think this is also a great spiritual passage for all of us to, to, to ponder as well. How many times have we had problems in our lives, difficulties, frustrations, health problems maybe, who knows what, stuff at work, stuff in the family in which we're praying and we're working on this and we're trying and it's still there. And we're thinking, God, where are you? Paul says, I prayed three times for this to be removed. What was it? We have no idea. Some would say maybe a, a temptation of some sort that he had. Possible. Uh, maybe, you know, we do see a couple places where Paul loses temper. So maybe something like that. Who knows? I've often pondered, and I, I have no idea. It, it, there's examples, there's hints that I think where Paul might be losing his eyesight. And he's starting to get frustrated. That he just can't see the way he used to see. And this is before glasses. And imagine the difficulty with the writing and stuff and all of that, and having to use a, a minuensis. Whatever it is, who knows? But he prayed three times at this time he removed. But he realized that God had given it to him. It was God allowed this. And then it was through this problem he had that he realized his utter weakness as Paul the man. And it's through this that God speaks to him and says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. It's only through you realizing how weak you are and utterly irrelevant that you can then become who you really need to be. This is the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. Okay, so... That is in chapter 12. I highly recommend reading that, pondering it, especially if you're dealing with those kinds of things in your life. In chapter 13, we come to the end of the epistle. He says, this is the third time I am coming to you. What? Okay, there we get into an issue that is way beyond what we can do here in a class like this. But there are debates. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles and you look at the Pauline Epistles, it looks like there may be an extra trip or something and maybe a couple extra letters that we don't aren't all that clear about. Someone suggested that 1 Corinthians might be two letters that have been combined in one in the lectionary of the Church of Corinth. Very very possible, something like that happened. But we don't have any details on this. But anyway, we, we know that Paul did go there and found the church on a second journey. We know that on his third journey, Paul's about to go there. What does he mean by the third here? Something we're, that we're not aware of. That's all we can do at a level like that today. Okay, so this is the third time I am coming to you. Any charge must be sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses in the Torah. I warned those who sinned before and all others. I warned them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them, since you desire proof that Christ is speaking in me. He is not weak in dealing with you but is, is powerful in you, for he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God, for we are weak in him, but dealing with you, we shall live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? I hope I hope you will find out that we have not failed, the apostles, the true apostles. But we pray, God, that you may not do wrong, that you, we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. 
For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. What we pray for is your improvement. I write this while I am away from you in order that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority which the Lord has given me for the building up and not for the tearing down. Finally, brethren, farewell. Mend your ways, heed my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you from Macedonia, as he speaks of in the epistle multiple places. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Annie, you had the bridge. Wow, Father Sebastian. That was yet another informative and entertaining evening. So, Father Sebastian, are you ready to dive into some questions here? No, but let's go ahead. <laughs> okay, let's go. How about, um, could you unpack a little bit more the love passage in 1 Corinthians 13? Um, because... <laughs> Uh, a lot of times, you know, this gets read at weddings and it's very, you know, nice and lovey-dovey. Um, but is yeah. that actually what Paul is going for in, in 1 Corinthians 13? Uh, it's not a wedding passage. So, but it gets used that way. Yeah. So, you know, historically, traditionally in the church, apostolic churches, East and West, the official reading, epistle reading at a liturgical wedding that is a non-emergency, which is the normal, uh, is Ephesians 5. But people often hate that passage in our modern world because they don't understand it. I, I cannot think of a more important passage to meditate upon as a husband and a wife than that passage. And so in the wisdom of the church, that's it, Ephesians 5. However, as you noted, I don't know when this starts, maybe the new lectionary in the West, there has been allowance to default from the norm, no, no, no to go from the default uh, to this other option, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which has almost become the norm now at weddings, because the priest will say, or it's during the pre-wedding, the pre-cana, what they call it, uh, that, uh, okay, here's the two epistle readings, you got to make a choice, and of course, there's it, it, they always move to 1 Corinthians 13, because they don't understand Ephesians 5. So let's look at chapter 3. It's a very short chapter, and um, and hopefully we can discern maybe a little more of the uh, the issues there. If I speak in the language of men, so this flows from the previous chapter. Chapter divisions are not in the original text. So you go back to the previous chapter, verse 12 through 27. I'm sorry, verse I'm sorry, verse previous chapter, chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it, and, verse 28, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then works of miracles, then healers, helpers, ministers, speakers in various kinds of languages. He puts it at the end. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Uh, do all possess the gift of healing? Do all speak? With languages, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way if I speak in the language of men and of angels, but have not love, charity. Charity would probably be a better English word here. Uh, the word love is perfectly fine, but in modern English, love also brings in all sorts of ideas of romanticism and things, but Charity might be a better English word, but have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and all faith, and so to remove mount, move mountains, but have not charity, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver my body to be burned, but have not charity, I gain nothing. Love, charity, is patient and kind. Love is not jealous nor boastful. 
It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away, right? Eventually, they are fulfilled. As for knowledge, it will pass away, right? For we have Christ. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect, right? It's all fulfilled in God in the second coming. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face in the future. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith. Hope, love, abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. I don't know. What else do you want in there? Is it Annie? Hmm? What else? What, what was the question? This is good just, stuff. Yeah. What, what does I the mean, person the, want to know? Well, just, you know, why this, I mean, is how, why shouldn't this be a wedding passage? Oh, it's a great wedding. I didn't, I'm sorry. I got so excited. I didn't hear, understand the question. Yeah, this is a great passage. I, I think husbands and wives could meditate. All Christians should meditate upon this, right? But Ephesians 5 is so much more important because Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the relationship of a man and a woman in the marital context. So it's way more uh, immediate in its, in its relevance. But it does talk about the same idea. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, yeah, let's go over to Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as the Lord. Oh, no, does he really mean that? We just keep reading. All right, so for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject to in everything to their husbands, obviously everything in righteousness. Husbands, okay, this is at that point, that's it. The ears are closed at a modern wedding. Oh my goodness, I can't believe they just said that in church. They're so misogynist. And they don't hear the rest of the reading. Look at the rest of the reading. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. Even so, in that manner, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ loves the church, does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave, goes on. Okay, so what woman would not submit to a husband that is willing to die for her? And the problem today in our modern society is we have now women who will not submit to husbands because we have husbands who will not die for their wives. On a daily basis, not just, you know, in war or something. If you got a man who's coming from work, phone rings, ring. Uh, yeah, honey, are you almost home? Uh, uh, no, um, I'm heading to the, we're going to the sports bar. There's, you know, it's the football game tonight. I'm going with the boys. I'll be home late. That man does not love his wife as Christ loves the church. He does not love that wife as he loves his own body. He has not given himself up for his wife. A man is to, a husband is to die daily. A true husband going to work, spending his life until his, his worn to the bone working. And you, some of you remember your old dad, or your grandpa like this, right? The old days, working to the end until they couldn't work anymore. Where's dad? He's at work. When's he coming home? When he comes home from work. 
whether he was out in the field, plowing the field, or is it some factory or whatever, he came home exhausted, wiped out. Mom fed him some dinner, shoved some food in his mouth, and he went to bed. And he woke up and he was gone before you even got up for school. That's the husband who died daily for his wife and children. He gave up his life for his family. And you find a man like that, you'll find a woman who will put herself under him in all godliness. Ephesians 5 is very beautiful. Andy, anything else? Why don't we let uh, Mara here on screen ask her question? Go ahead, Mara. No, Mara. No, no, not Mara. She's got, t- she always has difficult questions. No, Father. Uh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Just quick question, Father. I, I use, I wear the veil for different reasons. It has nothing to do because I know, but just wanted to confirm. Is it true? It's not in the Septuagint, the word veil. Was it? Or not? It's interesting. The, the only reference I can think of off the top of my head of the idea of covering the head is in the is is in the the Torah. Uh, and the idea of veiling and covering things is all over in the Bible. The English word veil is mean or just the concept of covering or hiding something. So just quickly, if you go back to Genesis. I told you, Annie, don't let her ask questions. Oh. You know, there are about a million people that want to ask about veiling. Fathers, so <laughs> we had to, t- we had to touch on this. All right. Uh, let's go back to, okay. This is Genesis chapter 24. So Rebecca is coming back. She's now being brought by the servant Eleazar to her new hubby. Isaac. This is in chapter 24, verse 62. Now, Isaac, Genesis chapter 24, verse 62. Now, Isaac had come from Beth uh, Be'er La Haroi and was dwelling in the Negev, that's southern Israel. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. He lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man yonder walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that had been done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and they lived happily ever after. So um, there's an example of the kind of the intimate connection of the veiling with the, the, the marriage there. Is that helpful more? Now, I'm imagining what you're asking is something that some of, you, some of the older ladies at least were asking in, the, in listening is, but wait a minute. When I was a little girl, I was five years old. My mom said, wear a chapel veil, put a little doily and stuff on it. Okay. What happened was in the early church, Jewish Christian culture, those who cover their heads, outward sign that they were hitched, unavailable, right? By the time you get to around 250, there is developed in the church this movement of dedicated virgins. All the way back in the time of Paul, there were already widows who, when their husband died, if they were older— would not get remarried. You can read about this in 1 Timothy. And instead, they would live together in community and serve the local Christian community as these dedicated widows. The earliest form, kind of like a little monastic movement thing. And then shortly thereafter, young women began to join them who had discerned they had not a vocation of marriage, and they began to live with these older widows and serve in the same capacity. But there was a problem because the young ladies had never been married. So they didn't have a veil. So you have a problem. Imagine you walk into a church in Ephesus and you see a again, left and right, right? They were in different sides. It's only recent, this whole mixed congregation thing. You'd, you'd look on one side. Let's say you're a young man. You're 22 years old, looking for a bride. You walk into the church you're visiting, 
And there on the side is all the women. And wow, look at the gaggle of young ladies who are available. All, you know, you know, 16 to 26. Whoa, this is the place to be for a young man. Lots of selection here. Well, he's mistaken because they are dedicated virgins who are, who are standing there with the widows. They're with them in the community, and they're there at the community liturgy, the community mass, and then they're going to go after the mass, and they're going to go out with the deacons and help take care of the poor. So by the time you turn on 250, you start seeing fathers of the church recommending to the dedicated virgins who are living with these dedicated widows, saying, okay, ladies, you got to wear the marriage veil like the old ladies are doing, because you're unavailable, it's confusing to people, and furthermore, it's practical. It's, it's it's rational. It's logical because you truly are married. You're 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 married to the church. You're married to Christ in a special way, and so wear the wedding veil. So they start doing it, and then that is eventually now you have married women wearing their wedding veil when they're in public, widows still wearing their wedding veil because they're not going to get remarried, and young ladies who have dedicated themselves to this life who are not married, wearing a wedding veil. And now you got basically the vast majority of the ladies in a local parish wearing a veil, whether married or not. And so it becomes customary, just by default, that young girls want to start doing what mom and grandma are doing. And so before you know it, all young ladies, even little girls, are putting on the wedding veil. Uh, and anyway, that's the history of the whole thing. In our, um, in our parish because I give catechesis on these things, people sometimes ask. In our parish, I recommend, though I don't require one or the other, I recommend they follow the old custom, and if they're married, they wear the wedding veil. Just like when they were got married, they put that veil on, they wear it until, okay. Uh, and if they're not married, then there's no need to wear the, wear the wedding veil. This, this is the history of the whole thing. And so I, I'm sure people freak out when they come to our parish. They hear that our parish is super traditional. They know that I'm a liturgical fascist, for good reason, I think. And then when they walk in, though, they see things that sh are strange to them. They see lots of women who are wearing veils, and then lots of uh, women who are not wearing veils. My two daughters, Natalia and Agatha, one's 16, the other one's seven, 15 and 17, I can't remember. Anyway, young, nice ladies helping with the choir, and they don't have a veil on. And they've asked me, Daddy, should we... Well, there's no need to unless you want to. I mean, you can if you want, but the whole point of this thing, the rationale, we got to go back to the early church context is everything. Anyway, I'm sure I've already said way too much. I'm sure, I, I'm sure I've offended people. Maura, did, we, did I answer your question somewhat, maybe sort of? You know, if you want to put a veil on, wear the veil, it's fine. You don't, it's okay. It's a, it's, but but I, the context, I think, is important, the historical context for all this stuff. Very helpful, Father Sebastian. Very helpful. Thank you so much once again. Can you uh, close us in prayer? Absolutely. And the prayer for this season. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling of death by death, and of those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Good spot to end on this, Annie, is when and we got to keep the traditions, guys. It's yeah. by the liturgy, our liturgical life, that the liter that the theology is passed from generation to generation. It's not theological manuals. They come no. and go. It's not catechisms. Luther invented the first catechism, okay? So it's just that Q&A format. So it's the liturgy that passes on this one. We must maintain the liturgy in, its, in, in every aspect that we can so that the faith is passed on authentically from, from generation to generation. When I was teaching at the Fraternity St. Peter Seminary in Nebraska, Latin Mass Seminary, after the first Pascha, Easter, as they call it, I walked into class and I said, Christus Resurrexi. They said it in Latin for them. Yes. And one of them, uh, no, one, they all looked at me like deer in the headlights. Said, so then some of you heard this story before. Been, and so, and then uh, they said, well, we don't do that. That's, that's Eastern stuff. I said, what do you mean you don't no, do that? that? <laughs> Christos vos cres. I just said, Christus resurrects. It's in Latin. Yeah, we don't do that. That's an Eastern thing. Oh. Hmm. Well, whatever. So I, I gave the lecture. I come out and there in the hallway, comes down the walking in the hallway, an old nun. She was a Benedictine nun. She was about 350 years old. 
and she was the librarian. And she was covered in dust and cobwebs. And she was walking down the hall. And I came out in the classroom, in the hallway, and I saw her. I said, oh, Sister Stephen, Christus Resurrexi. And she said, she stood up straight, like 50 years off her life. And the, she flung her cane in the air, and the walker went flying through the window, and the dust and the cobwebs came off. And she said, she said, Vera Resurrexit, Secret Dixit, Alleluia. And I looked at her, I said, Sister, how do you know that response? What do you mean, how do I know the response? This is what we always used to say back in the old days. But I was just in the classroom, and the seminarian said, you guys don't do that in the West. I'm taking over now. We, Go for it, Amy. we are so late. I have lost all control tonight. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Hope to see you next week with Dr. Jared Stout. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.